So, uh, this morning, I don't know, I, maybe I won't talk real long. Where's, where's the, I have one slide, yeah, inadequacy, inadequacy, and that's it. Yep. And that is all the, uh, all the PowerPoint we have to do. Where's the stool? Does anybody know where this stool went and walked on? It's all right. I just want to, I want to talk for a little while about inadequacy and uh, basically this is how it goes. The Lord calls us to do stuff, or the Lord, you know, you read the word of the stuff that, you know, the will of God, he wants us to love, he wants us to, to bless others and do whatever it is in your word, in the word that you see. But the truth of the matter is we are inadequate, okay, which means Inadequate means you do not have the ability, you do not have the resources, you do not have the strength to do the thing that the Lord has called you to do, okay? And you're like, well, that's dumb, but that's, what's up with that? God asks us to, to love, and then we don't even have the power to love. God asks us to go make disciples of all nations, and we don't have the power to do that. Well, in and of ourselves, yeah, that's it. That's the case. But that's kind of the point, because the Lord wants to give us the power. And I want to talk about three I'm going to talk about uh, three passages in the Bible, three instances in the Bible. And I, well, the first one is in Judges 6. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to Judges 6. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay with me, because I would rather you read your Bible at home than brought it to church. I mean, you bring it to church. But if you don't read it at home, you're missing out on a lot. So uh, anyway, if you left your Bible by your bedside, you should be reading it. So judges, so Joshua judges. Judges six. This is the, let's talk briefly about the story of Gideon. Okay. In Israel, after the Israelites came out of Egypt, and after Moses and Joshua uh, died, they had led Egypt. They they didn't have a king. They had these things called judges, and. Uh, I think the idea was the Lord was supposed to be their king. God was their king, but they had these guys who would lead them and kind of resolve disputes and whatnot. And so one guy was named Gideon, okay? And this is what happens. It says uh, in, Gideon, in Judges 6, Again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. So the bad guys in this case are called the Midianites. Okay, it says, Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. Listen, they came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. So, Israel forsakes God. They, they like forget about God, and they don't do his will. And then, so, here come the bad guys. You know, they didn't have any more protection, so the bad guys come in and, like, eat all their food all the time for seven years. And so, finally, Israel cries out to God. And so, what happens is God raises up a judge, and this guy's name is Gideon. Okay? So let's, let's look at this. In verse 11, it says, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiyaz, the Abiyaz right, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep from midnight. So threshing wheat, when you harvest wheat, there's an outer coating that has to come off for you to grind the wheat, before you can grind the wheat into flour. And so they would take the wheat kernels or whatever, the way I understand it, they'd take the little kernels of wheat and they'd, they'd toss it up in the air and the wind would blow off the chaff, that outer part, it was real light. And then the good stuff would fall to the ground. And so, but Gideon is doing it in a wine press. He's like doing it in a hidden place, okay? Because he doesn't want the Midianites to come take his food. So, you know, he's hiding out, okay? You know, trying to thresh his wheat so he can eat. And uh, an angel comes to him, okay? So what does the angel of the Lord say? When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon was like, Where? You know, what? Mighty warrior, where? What? What? I don't see one. No. <laughs> this is what Gideon says. So this is what I think. I don't think Gideon believed it was an angel. I think, I don't know, he just looked like another man. He 
says, But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. And this is what it, the, the, this is what it says. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? And he says, so the angel who represents God, who, you know, speaking for God, says, go save Israel. He says, but Lord, Gideon asks, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. He's like, I'm the puniest of the puny. Like, how am I going to do this? I can't, that's no way. I'm not big and strong and awesome. And it says, the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. So let me fast forward through this. Anyway, Gideon brings an offering, like he brings a meal to this guy, and then like crazy stuff happens, like fire consumes the meal, and he's like, oh my goodness, this really was God. This really was God talking. So anyway, I'm not going to go through the whole story, but this is what happens. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon Gideon, and he goes and he rallies an army in order to fight the Midianites. Now how many Midianites and other people are there? They're, they can't be counted. They're just throngs and throngs. They're like locusts, which is like a big swarm of grasshoppers, just a kajillion of these guys, okay? But somehow Gideon manages to, to muster, uh, I believe it was 32,000 troops. It sounds like, 32,000, that's pretty, that's pretty good. But, it, but, but there was, they were far outnumbered. They were far outnumbered by the Midianites. And so he gets this army, and the Lord's like, you have too many people. Says what's gonna happen, and God's like, what's gonna happen is they're gonna if when I help you defeat the Midianites, they're gonna be like, oh, Yahoo, Yahoo, we did it. He's like, I can't have it. You have. He's like, I have. You have to know that I did it, not these guys, not thirty-two thousand. So he's like, okay, Gideon, get up and tell everybody if you're afraid, just go home. And so like, like twenty-two thousand people leave. Okay, there were thirty-two thousand, and now he's down to ten thousand people. And God's like, there's still too many. And so he gives them another test. And he says, okay, send them all down to drink. And the ones that like, just, they, like they go to a lake or whatever, I guess. The ones who just like, get down and slurp up the water. He's like, send those home. But the ones who like, who dip the water and kind of make people look out. This, the word doesn't say that, but this is kind of what we infer. The ones who are watching, but it says the ones who, who take and lap the water like a dog. You know, these are the guys who are going to keep so after he sends everybody else home, he ends up with 300 guys. He ends up with 300 guys, okay? So, so Gideon, but he's had these signs from the Lord. He knows the Lord has spoke to him. Gideon's going to go defeat this throng of Midianites. So long story short, they end up, uh, God gives them another sign or two. And it's one night, you know, like the middle of the night or whatever. And, uh, and everybody has, has a trumpet and everybody has a pot, like a clay pot with a torch in it. And the way I imagine it, the torch is hidden. The torch is on fire, and it's up inside an upside-down pot, and you can't see the light, really. Okay? So you've got 300 guys, and it doesn't say they, they're holding swords in their hand. It says they've got a trumpet in one hand, and they've got this pot and torch in the other. So they're going to go fight, a, fight an army with a trumpet and a pot and a torch. And so anyway, there are 300 and they split, they like split up. And at one point, so imagine you're in the Midianite camp. You're in the Midianite camp, you're camping out sleeping out there. And uh, and all of a sudden they hear this sound. They first they hear trumpets blow all around, do, 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 300 trumpets, do, 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 which I don't know, maybe they imagine that represented like a bajillion soldiers, you know, one trumpet for every how many soldiers. And then they hear the breaking of pots, they hear. You know, crash, 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 all these, all these uh, clay pots breaking everywhere. And then they see all of a sudden light, bam, because the pots are broken and there's the torch. And then they see these 300 torches and everybody flips out. All the bad guys, all the Midianites flip out and they start killing each other. Okay, and they like run off. And so, and so then they're like, they're like, Ooh, wake everybody up, let's go get the Midianites. So they wake everybody else up in Israel or whatever, and they uh, are in the area. And they go and, uh, anyway, they beat the Midianites. The point of that, that was the first story, the point of that was, God took a man and he called him a mighty warrior. And he said, but I'm nobody. 
I'm the least of the least. And, and then whenever he raised an army that was kind of big, the Lord said, no, that's too big. I'm going to do it with a very small. I'm going to do what is impossible for you, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to use something that's very weak and very small and do the impossible. Okay? So that was the first story. See, Gideon was inadequate. Gideon was not enough. He could not do it, but the Lord was with him. The Lord had spoken to him. Okay, I have my scriptures here. The second scripture that I want to look at is Matthew 14. Matthew 14. In the New Testament. Okay. In the New Testament. Okay. Well, I'm not, I'm not used to this pages thing. The old fashioned way. Okay, Matthew 14, 22, this is what it says. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. So Jesus and the disciples have been out. He fed the 5,000. And so after that, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side of this uh, lake. I'm not sure which lake it was. Anyway. While he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Okay, so Jesus, they, they fed the 5,000, okay? And Jesus said, okay, disciples, you guys go get the boat and start crossing the lake, and I'm going to go pray. And he goes to pray, and then he's like, I'm just, I'm just kind of making this up, but... Jesus kind of like, oh, dang, the boat's way out there. How am I going to get there? See, he says, I know, I'll just walk. Okay, that's not in the Bible. The, the part what I just said is where it says that in the Bible. But so anyway, it's, it's like, it says it's the fourth watch of the night. Okay, whatever time that is. And so Jesus just goes out to them on the boat, and he's walking on the lake. And this is the famous story. Jesus is walking on the water. And Jesus, I don't know, maybe Jesus didn't think this was any big deal, because he was the Son of God. You know, he knew the Father. He knew the supernatural. But the disciples are there in the boat crossing the lake and lo and behold, they see Jesus and they start freaking out and they're like, it's a ghost! Okay, this is what they say, it's a ghost. And so, uh, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it's, it's me. Don't be afraid. And Peter, okay, Peter, this is who this is about. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, Tell me to come to you on the water. So everybody's flipping out seeing this ghost guy walking on the water. It's just Jesus. And he's like, if it's you, tell me. And so Jesus is like, come on. So Peter gets out of the boat. Okay, Peter gets out of the boat. And he starts walking on the water. Doing this crazy supernatural thing. Okay, so God, the Lord, he called him, come. Do, do the impossible, Peter. Come on, you can do it. You know, come on, come to me. It says, then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to see, cried out, Lord, save me. So, he's, I assume it goes like this. He's looking at Jesus, he's walking on the water, but then he stops looking at Jesus, and he starts looking at the wind, or the waves, or whatever, and he, be, he begins to sink. Well, let me tell you, if you try to walk on water, you will not begin to sink. Okay, you will see, you will go, bloop, you will go straight down. But Peter, you know, Peter's got to do the <laughs> kind of this stuff, I guess. He's like, Jesus, save it. And Jesus grabs him, and bam, you know, he's back up on top of the water, and they get in the boat, okay. And Jesus says, you have little faith, why did you doubt? And uh, it says, when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. So let me tell you about Peter. Peter was like one of the most, he's like possibly the most famous of the 12 disciples. And he did all this stupid stuff. You know, I mean, you know, granted, nobody else got out of the boat and tried it, but at least he tried. But anyway, he, he got out and he began to sink. And another time he's like, oh no, Jesus, you don't go to the cross. And Jesus has to say, no way. He says, that's the devil talking. Get behind me, Satan. Or Peter... I don't know, the disciples did a number of, or said a number of dumb things while they were around Jesus. But, you know, Jesus would teach them, Jesus would, would correct them, and uh, Jesus loved them, you know, he was there for them. But the disciples who later would change the world, they were inadequate, okay? This like ragtag bunch of 
like one guy was a tax collector and some guys were fishermen and one guy was a religious zealot and you know just this band of guys one was a thief and later on you know 11 would change the world but it's because they had the it was because the Lord came and the Holy Spirit came and they had the power of the Lord it changed them and anyway he did what they could not the third and final story I want to talk about David, okay? This is in uh, 1 Samuel 17. I'm trying to go fast. 1 Samuel 17. Yes. Huh? A zealot. A zealot comes from the word zeal, and a zealot is one is like a fanatic, okay? So it's like a person who's religious, but like crazy religious in a bad way. So, I just think there was a lot of diversity there. So, 1 Samuel 17. Okay, David and Goliath. David and Goliath, okay. So, the bad guys, in this case, are the Philistines. Okay, Israel versus the Philistines. This is back in the Old Testament. Now, the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. Da, 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 da. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall, or like nine foot nine inches tall, whatever. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a scale of armor, weighing 5,000 shekels. And my footnotes say that 5,000 shekels was 125 pounds, I think. Let's see. Let's see, 5,000 shekels is 125 pounds. Wow. His armor and his armor weighed 125 pounds. Who weighs? Do you weigh 125 pounds? On his legs he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. And it says that that much is 15 pounds. The point of his spear, the metal point of his spear, weighed 15 pounds. Okay. And Goliath went up and talked trash, you know, like for a basketball game or a football game, we tend to talk trash to each other. It says, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul, who is the king? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. And he says, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other, blah, 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 blah. So then there's David, and David has like six or seven brothers, and David's the youngest guy, and he's been at home tending his dad's sheep, okay? He's been, like his three oldest brothers went out to the battle to help fight the Philistines, but David's at home watching the sheep, okay? So, you know, maybe singing on his harp and writing songs and stuff. Of course, while he's there, he's killing a bear and killing a lion and whatnot. And so David, you know, David, little punk kid, he comes up and he's like, what is this? And he, let me see if I can find the verse, what David says. Because uh, he goes out there. <laughs> anyway, David says, basically, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Like, who does this guy think he is who defies the armies? Of Israel and David had, must have an understanding about God and who Israel is in the eyes of the Lord. Okay, and so David volunteers. Okay, David volunteers to go fight, to go fight Saul, to go fight Goliath. He says, and David said to Saul, "Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him." And Saul replied, "You are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he has been a fighting man from his youth." But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. That's crazy. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. 
So Saul agrees. So David, David is convinced that he can do the impossible. But I'll tell you, David is inadequate. This little boy does not have the ability to pull this off. But his confidence isn't in himself. His confidence is in God Almighty. So anyway, so little David, you know, little David goes out there to the Philist to the Philistines, but I like it. Goliath is some kind of joke. Okay? And he says, Am I a dog that you come at me with a, with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David come, David fires back. He says, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your hands. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. So Goliath goes up to whack him, and David takes a stone in his sling and he swings around, and it whacks him in the forehead, dead on. And Goliath just falls down, bam, in the dirt. Bam, he's dead. And David goes and he cuts off his head. And then, you know, then the Israel gets all excited and they go defeat the Philistine army. So they, you know, everything's cool. And that's the beginning. That's like the glorious big debut of David in Israel before he became king. So we talk about three guys. We have uh, Gideon, we have Peter, and we have David. And they were all inadequate. They were either weak, they were young, they, they did or thought stupid things, they were unqualified, whatever. But they had a word from the Lord, okay? They had something about them. They had an anointing, ultimately. And the Lord came in, and the Lord fought their battles. And whatever the Lord told them to do, the Lord actually did. The Lord helped them to do, okay? So, the last scripture I had, let's see what the reference is here. The last scripture I had was 2 Corinthians 4, 7, and I'll turn to it, but it says this. It says, we have this treasure in jars of clay. We have this treasure in jars of clay, or in clay pots, and this is how I understand it. Clay pots in that day and age were like cardboard boxes, kind of. They weren't anything special. They weren't, they weren't gold, they weren't silver, they were just clay. They were kind of low class, kind of like styrofoam cups, maybe, or cardboard boxes, you, you know, what are you going to put in a cardboard box? I don't know, just whatever. Junk, books, stuff. But if you had a treasure, if you had a treasure, you'd put it in a gold treasure chest or something with silver and jewels. But Paul talks, he says, we have this treasure in jars of clay. And to, it just makes me think, like, we, we, we're made out of dust. The says we're made out of dirt. We're made out of dust. These, these bodies that are one day going to die. You know, what is this? It's, a jar, it's like a jar of clay. It's like an earthen pot. But inside it, there's the spirit of the Lord. There's this crazy, powerful thing, or person, Jesus living inside of us. And so the Lord calls us to do this crazy stuff, like go out and, you know, go to China and work in an orphanage, or pastor a church, or, I don't know, start a business, work in the business world, go to college, whatever it is. And I just want to say that you are inadequate. You are not enough. You cannot do it. You are not strong enough. You do not have the strength in and of yourself. But if you will keep your eyes on the Lord, if you will look at Jesus instead of looking at the waves, if you will think about God instead of thinking about how big the giant is, you know, if you will think about God instead of thinking about how many kajillion camels and Midianites there are, then the Lord can fight the battle for you and the Lord will help you and to overcome and to do the thing he's called you to do. Okay. So it's a good, it's a good thing to know. It's a good thing to know that when we don't have the power, God has the power. I'm not saying you shouldn't train. I'm not saying you shouldn't work and try. I'm not saying you won't be involved, but the Lord is your partner. And he does all the heavy lifting. So that's what I wanted to say. Let me say this, though. I've been reading a book, or I was reading a book, about a revival that happened in, around Los Angeles 
in like 1906 to 1910 was the Azusa Street Revival. And it was this revival uh, when it was like the maybe the first big time that the gifts of the Holy Spirit came back to the church, at least in America. It was in the early 1900s. And the Lord would use teenagers. Like the, 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 this book I read was written by a guy who would talk to, the, to these old men and women, but at the time of the revival, they were teenagers. And the Lord would use them for healings and miracles and all kinds of crazy stuff. So tell you what, guys, you're not too young. Yes, you are too young. You're inadequate. But you know what? When the Lord comes in, man, you, He can do it. He can do it. He can do crazy yeah. stuff. So, anyway, I'll shut up. I'm going to pray. That's good. Thank you, Lord God, that we are inadequate in and ourselves. But you said that your strength is made perfect in our weakness. So like David, like Gideon, like Peter, Lord God, you come in and you transform our, you know, we're too young, we're too stupid, we're too weak, whatever. And you, it says the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. So God, I pray that you would help us to keep our eyes on you, to think about you instead of the big bad situation, the big bad problem, or the big bad enemy. And just think about you. And I believe, Lord, that when you have spoken, when we obey you, Lord God, that you come in and you gloriously, gloriously win the battle and save you. And I thank you, Lord, Lord, bless everybody here, bless everybody that didn't make it because of the rain or the time change or whatever. In Jesus' name.